am so excited. I love Omani Barberin. <laughs> and I was so excited that I could get um, her to come in and speak with all of us. Um, it is super important to hear her voice and she does have a lot to say. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to Omani. Hello everyone, uh, as previously discussed, my name is Imani Barberin. Um, I'm an African-American woman. I have dreadlocks. I'm wearing a purple floral top. Um, yeah, and I am a disability activist and advocate. I primarily use social media to talk about disability and the issues facing our community um, because social media has played such a pivotal role in our ability as disabled people to have our voices heard. And today I kind of want to take a lot of time to really encourage you all to bolster your own voices in whatever arena that you use. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. I was usually the only black disabled person in the room and I always constantly felt like I was alone. And I always felt as though I was pushing uphill with two different battles, both disability and blackness. Um, and what social media has done for me it is, is that it has shown me time and time again that I'm not alone and that every worst thought I had about myself, somebody else was thinking about themselves. And the way that we can use social media, the way that we can build community will help people quiet those thoughts a little bit. Disability stories are some of the most important tools in changing minds and building community and pushing the narrative forward. Disability has primarily been discussed through the lens of people who are non-disabled. So there are tons of people who do not have disabilities that are telling the world about us while our own voices and opinions are pushed to the back. And this has led to so much isolation as a community we always feel like we're alone. We always believe that spaces are not for us. And we have started demanding that they be built for us. When we talk about disability and activism, what we have to remind ourselves is that we are speaking for, for one another, but also with one another. Being able to discuss activism and and disability rights and our own personal experiences comes with the need to also listen to one another. I would be nothing as a disability activist, as a, as a disability social media personality, if it were not for the disability community. It is extremely important that I hear their voices and understand the ways in which I can both bolster their own voices and the ways in which I can falter and perpetuate harm unnecessarily. And when we come together as one, using these spaces, we are more powerful than we ever imagined. I love the idea of all of us having our own platforms and telling our own stories, but also I love the idea of every single one of us uplifting each other, knowing where we falter, knowing where, we, um, where we've missed the mark, and then building and, and recalibrating things so that we can better represent one another, so we could better help one another up. A lot of things, a lot of times people think that success happens in a vacuum, but disability justice tells us about interdependence. I need to rely on the disability community and they need to rely, be able to rely on me. I need to not only be an island of one, I need to build accessibility to my island so that other people can get here too. I don't like this idea of this, we have a very individualistic society and I dislike the idea that we get to where we're going completely alone or forget those that helped us get there. I hope that when you build your voices online, that, excuse me, that you remember those who paved the way. It was completely necessary that they help you, but also they really didn't have to. A lot of the engagement that we get on social media is voluntary. I, 
when I first started my social media platforms, I tried to respond to every single person that responded to me because I know that their following of me and their engagement with me was not to be taken for granted. All of these spaces require emotional labor and work just as any other space does. And so when somebody takes the time to engage with you and build community with you, please be kind, but also please build with them. Now, be kind, but don't be a pushover. That's just the little caveat that I have. When we build digital spaces, we are showing the sheer volume of the voices of the disability community that have so often been silenced by others. A lot of our stories, like I said before, are told not by us, but by people who have proximity to us and people who want to be our saviors. I always think about the ways in which disability tells us that we can build space for one another without being the main character as the teenagers say. You know, building space for because it's necessary, but knowing that you don't need to be the face of it. Building space so that one another, can, so that others can find one another, but without being its most famous member. I think that there's so much of a desire to build these platforms in the hopes that we detach from the communities and the identities that come from these marginalized communities in order to overcome disability. And while that narrative has often been pushed by non-disabled people, a lot of marginalized people fall into that trap too. We do not overcome our disabilities. We do not overcome our blackness. We do not overcome our queerness. We exist in our fullness in every space in which we enter. And we do so with one another. I don't ever want to be on any sort of stage saying that I overcame my disability. And if you ever hear me say that, you have my full permission to unfollow me in droves. I have never overcome my disability. I have succeeded with it, with my community and with every single marginalization that has kept me back. I didn't overcome a society. Excuse me, I didn't overcome a disability. I overcame a society. I overcame a society that was built not for me, but for everybody else around me. I overcame a, a, a system of oppression, um, of inaccessibility, of eugenics, that I overcame that. I did not overcome my body. My body was going to be what it was from the day I was born. I overcame the systems that said that my body was less worthy because of those identities. So do not be the person, and I hope all of you reach success. I hope all of you reach your goals, but please don't ever become the type of person that builds community and then forgets them once you get where you're going. Because this is the entire point. These moments right here are the entire point of why we do what we do, isn't it? So that we could look back and say, Let, come with me. I want you with me. I don't want to build alone. You have helped me this entire time. I don't want to leave you where you are. Let's come together. Come with me. Build with me. Create with me. Collaborate with me. Understand that we are the strongest we can be together. And that does not mean that we don't figure out, excuse me, that does not mean that we ignore the ways in which we exhibit privileges and other marginalizations, right? We don't ignore the things that make us better. We explore them. We explore race and disability. We explore gender and disability. We explore queerness and disability. That's where we get where we're going, right? by not ignoring the things that separate us from society, but by highlighting the ways in which we can use the privileges that we have to help others. I don't like this idea that we tell each other that, you know, 
that anytime we talk about race or or sexuality and things like that, that we're playing the oppression Olympics. For what? Who wins that game? People think of oppression as attention and social media has helped a lot with pushing that narrative, but it's not even remotely true. When we talk about our differences, when we talk about, about the ways in which disability inhabits us as individuals and the multiple intersections that we are part of, we're telling people how to treat us. We're telling people to be sensitive to the issues that they may not face. It is kindness in action. It's not niceness. I always tell people, especially when I build spaces online and build platforms and things like that, that there's a difference between being nice and being good. Nice is a performance. Good is your moral compass. Strive to be good. You don't always have to strive to be nice. So I think Vicky has some questions for me if she would like to, me to answer some. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. You're good. I'm always trying to like, am I on mute? Am I not on mute? <laughs> That's always my problem as well. So don't worry about it. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I would love for you to talk about the TikTok sensation. Mm -hmm. um, I find that there's so many people. I honestly, um, I have figured out how to find you. <laughs> but <laughs> I am in my 50s and I am still navigating that new um, system. So mm -hmm. I, I, the fact that you have been able to, um, you, are, you are a creator. Can you talk a little bit about the TikTok experience and what it's done for you? Yes, yeah, so I was one of the millennials that was roasting TikToks in 2019, very much so. Um, and then now I check it like every morning. It's very upsetting. Um, but, you know, being on TikTok, I always wanted to expand into more video um, based platforms. And I think it was a lot easier for me to transition from social media that was more text based to videos that were of a shorter length. Because what I'm really good at which I, and I'll to my own horn is condensing extremely complex issues into very short sentences that people can understand. And I really do enjoy that. Um, and TikTok seemed to be the very perfect place to do that. Um, and there's an entire disability community on TikTok and mostly it's very young kids, you know, 25 and under, and they're doing amazing things on this platform. And wherever I can, I try to boost them because they're, the next wave of disability advocates. Um, and yeah, and I think that it's, it's a lot of fun to do little trends here and there just to like show the, your humanity, um, but then hit them with the one-two punch. You know, every single um, social media tactic that you can use for advertising and marketing can be used for advocacy as well, um, if you do it in the right way. So yeah, I really do like TikTok and I didn't really expect that many people to follow me on TikTok. <laughs> I figured it would be like yet another place where, you know, I, I create like some content and then I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, but it really kind of took off. It did. It did. Um, Mark said, you can't really dance in text. This is true. <laughs> and I can't, I don't, I can dance generally, but I, I do try, I do try my hardest on TikTok um, to do what I can. Um, it's a lot of fun to kind of see all the dance trends. Um, but yeah, and I, you know, I just want to say too that I support like the black dancer strike on TikTok um, because, you know, there's always this idea of erasure for a lot of black artists that we're watching in real time on TikTok and um, all my love and support to them because I can't dance. So it's not me striking. It's just me sitting down. Um, <laughs> but I really do support them because they're doing really great work. <laughs> yeah, that I, I honest, I really enjoyed um, watching that. So, um, so, are are you comfortable talking about a little bit about your work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, with the Disability Rights Pennsylvania. 
um, more they are our- one of our sponsors here. And I just want to make sure that they people know that also that's that's a platform that you are a part of and amplifying that voice um, there. Yeah, it's really important too. I think that there's so much excellent work to be done in disability rights arena. And I, I'm, we're seeing a really slow but impactful shift of um, PNAs, protection advocacy agencies moving into um, moving into digital spaces to advocate, which is an excellent tool because a lot of people don't really get their news from original sources a lot. They get them from the people that they follow. Um, and so I love the work that I do at Disability Rights Pennsylvania and it really helps bolster the advocacy when you have lawyers be- behind you or when you have um, people who are really technically savvy in terms of the law and can speak to the different intricacies of legal uh, of the legal system and disability. And so it's been invaluable to be able to kind of sit and witness the work that has been done and kind of and amplify it using my platform as well as their own. Um, I'm the communications director there. They are doing amazing, amazing work. And every single day, it also, they don't know how to brag about themselves, which is very upsetting. Like <laughs> lawyers don't know how to brag about themselves, especially when they work for you know a rights-based organization. But um, between you and me, they're doing extremely amazing things, things that um, disabled, disabled people struggle with every single day. They come in, they advocate, and they give people their autonomy back, which is everything to our community. Absolutely. I love the work that is being done. I am always making sure that I boost that information that um, you put out on behalf of Disability Rights Pennsylvania. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is. It is super important, and everybody needs to read it. It is about you. It. They are doing it for you and with you, which I think is so important. Yeah, and the most important thing is with. Like they will not get up there and tell you what you should, what you're supposed to be doing. When they advocate for you, it's what you want for yourself. That is the most powerful thing that could ever happen. You know, like right. So, there's so many, you know, charities and organizations out there that'll be like, well, this is what we need for you. And you're going to do A, B, and C and Disability Rights Pennsylvania says, no, what do you want for yourself? What is your, what are your goals? What does your independence look like to you? And how can we help you get there? Absolutely. Just love that. I, I have to tell a very funny, quick story of Amani, um, reached out to me in December and asked me to do um, an event for your hol- for the holiday party. Yeah. I had so much fun and I thought to myself when I when I thought about doing the the trivia, you know, I was like, oh, this will be great. And then I I had a panic attack right before it because I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm like I'm going to be like going up against attorneys who are going to be telling me no, that's that that answer isn't right. <laughs> <laughs> that's I that's their job. They're <laughs> so competitive. It's just the funniest thing. Like, I'm like, what are you? I'm like, it's okay. It's okay to lose. Like, no, it's not. It's never okay. Like, the only thing you're winning is a Zoom background. Like, I, have I have to win right now. I'm like, okay, calm down. Um, but they they're really passionate about literally everything. They yes. they their minds too. Yeah, it's so funny because I've thought about it a totally different way um ever since I did it with you because they were like I want half credit (laughs) (laughs) which I just thought was so much fun um it was a ton of fun yes um so what do you think needs to be done in racial equity within the disability community yeah so I you know First and foremost, I think that one of the things we need to really contend with is the white supremacy within the disability community. Um, Most of our representations of disability are of white people and of those mostly white men. And that really sets us up to fail, you know, in terms of politics and perception, because when we talk about the disparities of disability, people who, how to put this, people who are disproportionately affected by disability are black and brown communities. 
you know, indigenous people have a rate of disability in their communities of up to 30%, black people of up to 25%. Um, and uh, there's a lot of other minorities who are self-reporting who are probably hiding a lot of disability because the system itself does disable you. Um, environmental, systemic, um, interpersonal, racial violence, it all leads to disability in some way. Um, and so we need to really kind of diversify our representations of disability and what disability means, not only racially, but from certain ethnic uh, and cultural perceptions. You know, I'm not gonna have the same exper experience as somebody who's Desi or Indian and disabled. Like their family experience is gonna be fundamentally different from mine. Um, and we need that representation too. You know, somebody who is um, native and disabled, I would not understand the complexities of that identity. And so while I can boost it, while I can make sure that I can bring it to a wider audience, it still needs to happen. Um, so that's kind of what we really need to do. And what we're, what we're watching now is, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of the like discussion over rights racially have a lot to do with disability. You know, a lot of these, you know, voting restrictions affect disabled people disproportionately. You know, it's disabled white men who are threatening the reproductive health of um, people who have uteruses. Uterus side, you, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the plural that is. I always <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. It's like octopi, octopus. I don't know, um, <laughs> but but yeah, and so we and we also do not hold um, specifically white disabled people accountable for racism um, very well, and it we're seeing that on social media platforms, we're seeing that politically, and it's it'll do real damage to our community as a whole if we are not able to get on top of this and really start to have these really difficult conversations, whether it be pl in playing language or not. Um, like really just diving in deep and saying, this is what we need to talk about. Um, and so that's kind of where I, I'm at right now. And, and also with police violence too, and, you know, 50% of the, of the deaths caused by police are of disabled people. Um, and we all share that fear but it's, it's different when you're black and disabled and it's a different kind of fear that happens. Um, so yeah, I really do think that we really need to contend with the dynamics within our community that erase, erase race and disability as well as, as culture and disability because they're all different things and we can be stronger by understanding one another. And also it's really cool to kind of like hear people's experiences and kind of like understand them a bit better. Um, yeah, I really do enjoy just talking with other disabled people, you know? Yeah, that's the one thing I love um, is just being able to bring um, different narratives to the table and being able to just, I love to sit back and listen. So that way I know how to um, um, be a better ally mm -hmm. um, because that is uh, something that I strive for. Um, but it is also with the space that I have, um, it's important for me to make sure that I, I tell everybody that disability pride is about all disabilities and everybody. And so I strive to make sure that everybody has a voice within the things that we're doing. Yeah. Um, um, and I, that I, anytime anybody wants to, you know, be, you know, have a voice, I try to make sure that I open up a space somewhere for them and get, be able to let them do that because yeah. every voice is important. It is, you know, and I think, um, I think with disability, especially we're kind of, there can be this sense of competition, um, not very much so, but that you do feel it sometimes where people are like, I'm trying to get my viewpoint out there. It's like, oh, I mean, okay, but you know, let's, let's talk about people who don't really have, um, don't usually have the opportunity to speak to their experiences and who feel nervous to. Um, but I will say that the disability community is one of the most welcoming in any space, um, but we just have to live up to it in every space. 
Right. I, I always tell, you know, I, I'm, I'm very conscious to tell people that disability is the most um, inclusive community because we take everyone. <laughs> and at some point we will take everyone. <laughs> yeah. Like, and that's such an unpopular opinion for like a lot of disability advocates. So like, they should listen to us regardless. And like, I mean, yeah, they should, but they're not gonna, unless, you know. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I understand that too, all the time. It frustrates me so much, but usually the greatest inroads you get is when you're being like, hey, you know, you're very fragile, right? Like, <laughs> you're, like you're just, you're, you're a bag of bones, literally. Like, so. I, I mean, I tell people it's as simple as turning around the wrong way. Oh yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> I, I, like disabled people have the exact same experiences because like anytime we wake, anytime we go to bed or like we shift in like in the most minute way, all of a sudden our entire body cramps up and we're like out of commission for a good day and a half. Right. Um, so I get that completely. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I, you know, I had a a friend who just couldn't get it, and I said, you know. God forbid um, mm -hmm. that tomorrow you're going off to work and you cross the street and get hit by a car. Right. You could be disabled from that just fluke of something happening while you're crossing the street. <laughs> yeah, or even just like COVID, like, you know, there's oh. smallers and like people, when, when I was, when, at the early stage of the pandemic, I was like, this is a mass disabling event, isn't it? And people were like, no, it's either life or death. But I don't think that's how life works. Like, you know, like there's shades of gray in every single area, including infectious diseases. Um, so yeah, even getting a virus, you know, having an auto, an overreactive auto, autoimmune response. Absolutely. So since you brought up COVID, mm -hmm. can you give us your take on the pandemic and <laughs> just kind of where how you feel about it and what you think that uh society um missed um and didn't think about yeah society missed everything <laughs> um with the <laughs> like, like, if you want a running list I think I have one like oh my God. <laughs> um but I think that early on we were really just kind of at a loss you know and the thing is, you know, we, I understand, you know, that the CDC and the WHO, um, um, the WHO were like trying to figure out, you know, information as it was coming in, but the sheer amount of resistance to just following directions, you know, just, it, you know, and I've, I've said before, you know, your individual health is a group project. You know, we every single day rely upon um, one another to survive, whether that's some, trusting somebody to, who's qualified to get behind the wheel of a car or, um, you know, hoping that your food isn't, doesn't have E. coli on it. We trust each other every single day with our health. Um, but the idea that with a pandemic, you can't do that is ludicrous on so many different levels. And also, um, watching people just pass and, you know, justify why people with disabilities should die, you know, for the economy or for, you know, the, the, the American dream because we're not stopping for anybody. And um, that's not really feasible <laughs> because but you know, with an infectious disease, even if you don't die, you could be the very person you d decided was disposable, you know, because you know, a lot of people don't go to the doctor at all because they can't afford it. So what's to say that you do not have an underlying condition that could lead to your death because of this disease. Um, yeah, so I think that a lot of people got a lot of things wrong and then also watching everything become accessible all of a sudden was really annoying. I remember I very much so like had a major conniption early in the pandemic because I was furious um, because it's, one of, it's that fury where you've been like, so you've been saying it for so long um, that everything could be accessible, that accessibility works for everybody, that we could build this for one another, we could be kind to one another, we could be accommodating to one another. And then like at the drop of a hat, we have accessibility, we have work from home, we have telecommunications, we have um, 
hospital visits from home. We have doctor's visits. We have um, community events from home, you know? Um, yeah, I definitely had like a major break. Like I was, I was, I was very upset. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we, and you know, I, I tell everybody, I'm like, it was about money. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I think, and I think like I'm reading this book called disability and capitalism um, right now. And it's, we're not seen as valuable, you know, in this, in this capitalistic system, we're not seen as necessary to even keep alive. And, and so that really is what led a lot, a lot of people's pandemic responses, unfortunately, um, under this belief. But when you just put, when you think of disabled people as disposable, you yourself are disposable because you yourself are not pro- your ability is not promised from day to day. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Um, so I'm going to transition into. Uh, you wrote an article last year. <laughs> okay, um, and it was. It was an article on how to properly celebrate a civil rights law during the pandemic in which the subjects were left to die and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yes. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about the article, why you decided to write it and, and how you feel about it a year later? Sure. I was very much so filled with dread and rage at the exact same time. Um, and it, I was very angry because people were doing all these like inclusion initiatives and all those things. And I'm like, every single second that we do not take this seriously, you're leaving disabled people to die. And yet you want me to talk about inclusion of like of disability? Um, and And like all these companies were making like, you know, like they like they usually do, but like you know wheelchairs that can climb stairs and you know like um, uh, braille Lego bricks or whatever, and, and we're just sitting here like, oh my god, it's, it was so gaslighting to kind of like be be like in the midst of a disability celebration in which medical rationing guidelines were in full swing quite literally during that period of time, um, and I was literally I felt like I was losing my mind because I'm watching like all of these honky dory little, you know, events for disability and, you know, inclusion articles and like all these companies that are so excited to, to show off their disability initiatives, but cannot bother to close their doors to keep their employees with disabilities safe, you know, who are so worried about the economy. Um, so who are so worried about the economy that, um, they're willing to dispose of us. Like you cannot have both at the same time. Like stop lying to me. So I was, I was very, I was very angry. And um, I don't know, I feel like right now um, I'm very resigned. I'm like, you know, I'm very just like, I, you know, it's, it's very weird because we went through a mass trauma for an entire year and people are acting like it never happened. Um, and like the sheer amount of terror that disabled people had every single day during the pandemic, like, is this allergies or is this a cough or is this, um, am I, you know, um, am I have, do I have COVID? Like I, I used that, I have a pollen app on my phone because I would start coughing and think it was COVID, but really it was just my allergies acting up. I, I acted with so much fear every single day. Um, and I'm just kind of like exhausted of <laughs> the performance of inclusion and, um, I kind of, something in me broke, like I've, I, like I have a very much so like a fuck you attitude towards life right now, um, where it's like, what is the point of this, of all these respectability politics of, of us being told that we have to do the right thing or A, B, and C in order to be included if we work hard enough, if we try hard enough, if we do A, B, or C, who cares? You know, <laughs> why am I performing for people who would literally throw me away? Um, and so I have a very much, like I'm very much so, well, before the pandemic, I was very much so certain of myself, but even more so now, I'm like, I don't care. Like, just like I don't care. <laughs> oh, like, I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you, you know, you, I don't care what your advice is for me about how I should um, hold myself and how I should uh, move about this world. If you are literally gonna throw me away, who, what, who cares about your opinion? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, 
I have a question. Um, so I have this um, aversion <laughs> to, to DEI, mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and all everywhere they're popping up, um, you know, all, every, all of these companies are now, um, are now hiring a DEI expert, you know, and, and they're talking about all of these things and they keep opening up these spaces where it's like, let's bring DEI experts in and you should be able to tell us like how to be inclusive. Um, do you find in those spaces that they don't talk about disability? Often they don't. Um, there's been a more of an increase in at least requests for me to speak on DEI initiatives. Um, for those, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's like a trickle um, from a lot of organizations. It's mostly like already intersectional organizations and things like that. Um, and I think DEI in and of itself, you know, so trigger warning, but like I think of DEI much like I think of, you know, um, suicide prevention, which is like, it's important, but it, you're just treating the symptom and not the cause. You know, you're treating it like the expression of systems of racism and, um, and, um, and, and bigotry and systemic oppression, but you're not actually talking about the cause um, because people want the facade of, um, the facade of inclusion, but not the actual work of inclusion they want and so like I won't knock yet because it very much so pays my bills but um but um I do find it it can get frustrating you know that have diversity equity and inclusion Maria um I do feel like um it's very much so like build build it like if you if you want to be about it be about it um, my mom said like don't talk the talk walk the walk and she was always, she was always really instilling in me to be very wary of people who talk to the game, but didn't ever follow through. Um, and so that's kind of why I want DEI to be, is that be, be about it. If you're gonna do it, be about it. Don't just smile on our faces. Don't just paint streets with Black Lives Matter signs. Don't change the names of A, B, or C. And also, can I just say, most black people don't care about Juneteenth being a federal holiday. Quite literally, we could care less. Um, like, just stop killing us. Like, that's literally all we asked for, and we got a federal holiday instead. Like, that's a slap in the face. Um, and, and a lot of DI work is very similar to that. So, yes, I um, I just I I I I don't know. I I just feel like they're trying to like quickly like put a band aid on something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Turn around. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the last thing that I have for you, um, and then we're going to turn it over to Q and A mm -hmm. is okay. We live in Philadelphia, so I'm going to be very Philadelphia specific. <laughs> um, what are your feelings around the, uh, both of us, um, being a part of the LGBT community um, of the stuff that's going on now in the LGBT community here in Philly. Which specifically? Okay, so, um, well, the, the, the Philly Pride, um, the PPE, um, and the fact that, you know, oh, to me, the PPE needed to be changed. Mm or the, the Philly Pride Presents, uh, for those who don't know what PPE is, um, because it's not inclusive, it, mm -hmm. events aren't accessible. Uh, what kind of changes do you think we need to make in our community in, with that? Yeah, I, and this goes back to intersectionality, and I just wanna to touch upon this aspect to it too, is that when you are in a society that deems your sexuality or any part of you as optional to have around, your access to things like healthcare and, and supports uh, diminishes incredibly. And so there's a lot of people in the LGBTQ community with disabilities 
because they're not getting adequate care because of homophobia, transphobia, all of those things. That being said, you know, the, the, the idea that any pride parade wants to exclude, yeah, exclude disabled people, because I'll just say exclude, because I'm not gonna like beat around the bush and be like, well, they're not actually intentionally. I mean, after a while, after enough people tell you that what you're doing is not inclusive, you're excluding people. Um, there's such a reluctance in it to involve us and it has to do a lot with pretty politics and us not being seen as desirable or ABC. But um, yeah, I think that nationwide we should have pride celebrations that are accessible or at least a component of them that where people could participate from home or you know have an event or like a little concert or something that people can feel like they're in community with people that they share marginalization with. Um, and it's not just unfair, it's, it's very angering. Um, it's very angering to watch a lot of these things go on, um, and to and for people and for people to constantly act surprised when it when a queer issue becomes a disability issue, and when it's been a disability issue the entire time. Um, so I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, it's very much so frustrating, and you know, it's, right now with Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia might be on the spot because um, we are you know, in Philadelphia, but it's nationwide, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was I was sad that, well, I'm not sure I can say that. It's, okay, it's sad <laughs> that the PPE had to disband um, mm -hmm. and that the pride celebration um, that happens had, uh, is not happening this year. Um, mm -hmm. I, to me, the um, the Philly um, Pride um, net was never accessible for for everybody, um, mm -hmm. but it also um, it became very it became very corporate. Um, yes. So I was in Pittsburgh the first week of of Oct of June, and mm -hmm. Pittsburgh held its um pride parade while i was there and i i was so excited i was i got myself all done and i went and i walked the parade and it their parade is very grassroots oriented and it's yeah. about they talk about civil rights they talk about i mean it's it's so different than it is here in philadelphia so i just yeah. i just um i hope that we we think about it and we kind of try to go back to some of that here in, here in Philly. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, and I really want there to be like real community. I don't want it to just be like a parade. Like you just kind of like see people and then you go home. Like there should be right. community built in. There should be supports built in, you know? Um, Absolutely. That's my hope. Yes. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open up the floor for anybody who would like to ask a question and I already have some folks that have their hands raised. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, um, everybody, if you would like, I'm gonna remove our spotlights and people can turn their cameras on. Um, and I'm gonna call on Becca Weber first um, because they had their hand up. Hello, um, so, First of all, great presentation. Um, I love, you know, listening to your work and things like that. Um, so I wanted to know, you were talking about um, painting like Black Lives Matter on streets and things like that. And like, you know, we've seen like military bases be renamed and, um, you know, like statues being torn down. Do you think like that's important or it's more important to like, you know, defund the police and like, you know, bring money back into the communities? Or do you think like we can have like, you know, both? Or like do you think one, one, one is more important than the other basically? Yeah, so to your question, I think, um, I don't want one without the other. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah. Like I don't want people to paint a, paint a street sign or, or take a street sign and paint a street or, you know, do whatever they want with kente cloth or whatever. Um, you know, without 
with without this this systemic changes. Like I don't want one without the other. It, it's and actually, you know, a lot of these little superficial changes are really just a slap in the face for a lot of black people because we're like you're trying to, you're trying to perform in our faces when we can see the deeper issues that you're not fixing. Um, so yeah, I really don't want one without the other. Like it's all fine and good to like change names of buildings and stuff, but not without the systemic change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I had another question too. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about the oppression Olympics, like basically you're saying that playing the oppression Olympics helps nobody in the long run basically. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that it's not, when we talk about our different marginalizations, it's not the oppression Olympics. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people like to try to one up one another. Um, and, some, and sometimes um, bringing to the table that a perspective that you have because of a marginalization, marginalization that somebody doesn't have is usually deemed uh, the oppression Olympics, even though it's not. You're just kind of showing them where they don't, what, what they haven't recognized, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not really the oppression Olympics. You're just kind of making their analysis more robust. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, thank you. Of course. So next we're gonna let uh, Will. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Hello, um, hello, Monty. This is Will Freed. I'm here speaking. Like, I just want to let you know, first of all, that I'm a big um, fan of your work and appreciated everything that you have um, done. Um, and the one thing that I like, like, I know a lot about diversity and equity and inclusion, like in our practices. But the one thing that I want to see is universal design be more built into that. And, and my question is, how can we work with places to include universal design with our current DE, DEI practices? Yeah, so universal, so how do I put this? I like universal design, but the more personal um, an experience is, the more specialized the accessibility should be. Um, so th that's first and foremost. So, you know, because there's different, differing accessibilities and oftentimes conflicting accessibilities, but for public spaces, there should be universal design at the very least. Um, when we talk about when we talk to DEI people, one of the things that they don't understand is the intersection between disability and race, and that by not building for disability accessibility, they're also excluding people by race because oftentimes people of color are disproportionately affected. When we bring in the intersection, that's how you kind of need to frame it: is that there are a lot of people that do not disclose a disability because they're fearful of how employers or organizations will react. Um, especially if they're along the line, if, especially if they're multiply marginalized. Um, so yeah, bring back the intersection, tell them about the intersection and tell them the reasons why people don't disclose a disability and why designing accessibly regardless will bring more people into the fold. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, yeah. And this is why like curb cuts have be been created over time on our streets to or automatically think about that accessibility. That is one thing for universal design that's yeah. been that's been taken. Yeah, but thank you for your time. Of course, thank you. Does anybody else have a question that they'd like to ask? Uh, well, a comment on Will's discussion. Uh, surprise, lots of people without disabilities use things like ramps people with bikes, moms with strollers, and so on. They're, mm, in Philly, you think there might be a crowded sports bar or two somewhere out there? Maybe, you know, and noisy enough <laughs> that the closed captioning gets turned on because otherwise no one can hear the game. Mm -hmm. Access works for everyone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. I agree with that 100%. Um, yeah, but a lot of people don't think about those things until like it's brought to their attention, which is upsetting because the ADA has been around for a long time um, and people still act like it's like the newest, it's the newest thing since life spread. I am as old as the ADA, so. Um. <laughs> yeah, um, so I know that, okay, so uh, the last question I'm going to I'm going to bring up um, was done was asked by Laura Z, and she asked, "How do we get a hold of you? 
how do we f follow you? How do we learn more about the amazing things that you do? Sure. So you can go on crutchesandspice.com. That's my website. Um, I, you, I have a bookings and brands, so you can email me through my website directly. Uh, it goes directly to my own inbox, by the way, um, that I set up. <laughs> um, and you can contact me through there or through my social media. Um, I'm either Imani Barber or Crutches and Spice across most platforms. Um, so you'll be able to find me regardless, but I'm all over the place to be honest. Um, you may even find me walking around Philly, just like getting moon pies from Ready Terminal. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, it's it's very hard um, not to see Imani yeah. um, <laughs> with all of the work that you do. Um, and and I just, uh, you know, I'm all, I always find it amazing. Um, can you do me a favor and just drop your website into the into the chat for somebody who just would like to be able to click on it easy and and um, find more information because I know there also you can find all of your social handles there so people can follow you because they should. Yeah. <laughs> it is it is the it is some of my greatest joys during the day is to is to see something that you that you put up. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your honesty, being upfront, being unapologetic, unapologetic, and um, taking the time to speak to all of us. Um, because again, I knew that when I was doing this, that I needed your voice to happen here in our space. Um, and, and I'm very excited that anybody who has missed this, um, we'll be able to also see this on our YouTube channel coming very soon in July. And we'll make big announcements, let everybody know, um, because I think people need to hear this even beyond this discussion today. Thank you. I appreciate you asking me. I know I remember last or the last time we had an actual in-person disability pride parade. I was like, how can I get involved? <laughs> I will give you my email. I will give you my direct <laughs> phone number. How do I do it? I was very, because every single time, and I do miss having it in person. It's great to have it digitally, but it's so much fun. I love going to disability pride parade. Like, and I also make my, you know, it's just, it's just so much fun. Thank you. Well, I will tell you that um, if we continue to get better day by day, that next year, Disability Pride PA and the Philadelphia Parade will be 10 years old. Ooh. And so my hope is that we have the biggest blowout in the city um, around Disability Pride Philadelphia. And I'm also excited because we have already began talks so that there will be a Disability Pride Central PA next year oh, cool. and a Disability Pride Pittsburgh event next year. You know what I think we should do too? Now this is just spitballing. We mm -hmm. should have uh, a Pride Pride Parade, a Disability Pride Pride Parade. I love that. Right? That like, we could have all, like we'd have one in June and then in July. That'd be great. Absolutely. I think that would be amazing. I'm. I'm so down for that conversation. Whoever wants to, to, to bring me in, because I'm doing it. Y'all, so. let's do it. All right. So thank you to everybody who came out for this conversation. We are so grateful for your, your time. Um, thank you again to our um, <clears throat> interpreters, Maria and Rachel, for their interpreting for us to make sure that we are accessible to everybody who wanted to join. Um, and remember tonight at seven o'clock, we're gonna be talking faith and disability, mm. a brand new conversation. Um, and I hope everybody turns out for it. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day here in Philly. It is a beautiful, hot day. <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you everyone. <laughs>